the whole idea of the series is to try to help people understand what it means to know God and how in the world we get there. You know, I just, no matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, it's like yeah. you get that opportunity just to come back and say, Lord, I just really want to know you. It doesn't make any difference how old you are. You still want to know God better. You still got, want to know him more. And for me, I, I always think to myself, why didn't I know this 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago? Well, it doesn't make any difference. This is where I am now. Thank you, God. <laughs> I get to know you better. When you think about a marriage, you know, whether it be uh, like you and Betty have been married, yeah. you have have some decades of marriage, and yeah. for, and, and then you look at that, and the way that you and Betty, you can just look at each other across the room, you know what each other's thinking. There's that depth of maturity in love, and then you look mm -hmm. at a newborn couple who, they can't sit next to each other without yeah. putting an arm yeah, on yeah. each other, and, and and that's the beauty of, of this idea of intimacy is because it's never stagnant. It's like no matter how long you've been walking with Jesus, you just yep. keep going back to it. And there's new lessons and new truths, and I think one of the things that I'm so excited about about teaching this week is that you know it gives us really a chance to to assess our own hearts. Like the message is called, "Hey, how's your heart?" Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. You know, where, where's your heart at in regards to this? And that's everybody. You know, when Lynn and I first got married, now almost eight years ago, I remember when you just marry someone, you don't really know all of their mannerisms or the way that they speak or the, the way that they express things. And I know that for my wife, Lynn, she grew up in California. I grew up in New Jersey. And I remember I would come home from the office and she'd say to me, you know, Daniel, how's your heart this morning? Now, it's a sweet thing to say, right? How's your heart? But for a guy from New Jersey, I mean, let's just be honest, he just didn't talk like that, you know? And so, you know, I grew up in a very sarcastic family, and so I'd respond to her normally something like, well, you know, it's in the center of my chest, you know, it's beaten, you know, at a nice steady pulse, kind of comfortable. And she would be like, oh, come on, Daniel, you know what I mean. You know, and it's a great question, though, isn't it? How's your heart? And... As Pastor Bill and I, as we're in this series called The Mission, what we're doing is this. You all know, those of you who have been here at Crossroads for a while, that, that the foundation of our church, the vision of our church is knowing, growing, and showing. And you've heard that it's on your bulletin, it's on the signs on the outside of the door. And as we begin this next chapter, we really wanted to take some time and, and put the mission of Crossroads front and center. And so we began this first section, which is called Knowing. And then after we're done with this, then we're going to do a series on Growing. And then we're going to do, finally, a series on Showing. Now, last week, Bill did an amazing job, as we looked at John chapter 13, of talking about what Jesus has done. Remember, Bill gave us, a, gave us all a word last week that we had come up with. It's the word divintimacy. Do you remember that? Divintimacy. And divintimacy means intimacy with the divine. Intimacy with God. And so we're spending time looking at this. Now, last week we saw, of course, that Jesus taught us how God seeks to have intimacy with us. And he did it by serving us, by, by blessing us, that, that he was humble enough to wash the disciples' feet. Now, what's interesting is God desires intimacy with us. We all know, whether we articulate it or not, that we desire intimacy with God and with people. When I'm speaking of intimacy, I'm not just speaking of physical intimacy, but true heart connection with people. Isn't that, don't we long for that? We long to know and be known. Now, on God's end of the spectrum, God has done everything that needs to be done for us to know Him. So if God has done everything that needs to be done in order that we would know Him, then the issues with our divintimacy, our intimacy with God, it's not on God's side of the wall that the problem is. Really, the problem is where? If we're honest, it's on our side of the wall. God has done everything that is necessary for us to know Him, but the struggle doesn't come on God's side, it comes on our side. And it's amazing that after that great picture of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, as we continue on here in John chapter 13, we get this next 
piece of the puzzle, which is the human heart. Now, I wanted to put a scripture verse over this section. And that would be Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, where it says this. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. It's a great scripture, isn't it? Proverbs 4, 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. In this text, we're exhorted that we need to mind our heart. We need to keep a guard over our heart. We need to keep a, a watchful eye on our hearts, because out of our hearts spring the issues of life. And that's important for us, isn't it? Because if you think about what the heart is in biblical language, the heart is not referring to the blood pumping organ in the center of our chest, but the heart really is the control center of your human life. It takes the information from the feelings, from the intellect, the information from the body. And in the heart, in, in the Bible it's actually, you'll laugh, it, in the Hebrew it's actually the bowels. In, in, in Hebrew culture, it was the bowels. Now, when we think of bowels, it has a whole other implication, doesn't it? If I said, keep your bowels with all diligence, you'd be like, hey now, Pastor Daniel, come on now. But even in the, in the old Hebrew, when they use the word bowels, they're not speaking of what we think of as bowels. They're speaking of that place that's the control center of the human life where the eternality of who we are in God meets with the naturality of who we are on a day-to-day -day basis. It's where all the information from all of the senses and the Spirit of God intersect and decisions are made. So for each one of us, we need to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. And so today we're going to see three different types of hearts from John chapter 13, verses 18 to 38. I'm going to tell you the three of them, and then we're going to unpack it verse by verse here. First, we have Judas and the betraying heart. That begins in verse 18, and that continues on to verse 30. Judas and the betraying heart. Next, from verses 31 to 35, we have Jesus and his exhortation to his apostles and to us to have a loving heart. So you could say it's the church and the loving heart. And then finally, in verses 36 to 38, we have Peter and the denying heart. So we have Judas and the betraying heart, the people of God, the church, and the loving heart, and then Peter and the denying heart. Now, before we start, I need to make a point, and it's an important point, and I want to make sure that we really get this. Jesus died on a cross because all of us have heart problems. All of us do. There is not one person in the world, save Jesus alone, who does not have a terminal heart condition where their heart betrays them. Their heart denies Jesus in it. So the reality is what we're going to look at, all of us, if we're honest, are going to see aspects of each one of these at work in our own heart. But I don't want you to walk away and you hear this, you think, oh no, this is a mess. The reality is, is yes, it's a mess, but Jesus died and rose again. This is why we believe in Jesus in the first place, because we all struggle in our hearts. Our hearts are not as they ought to be, but God still loves us so much that he would send his son to come and die on a cross to forgive us for the mistakes that we've made. So as we see in each one of these types of hearts, as we see ourselves in there, I want to encourage you not to despair, but to simply return to God and say, God, I'm sorry. Let me know your forgiveness in Jesus afresh. Let, let the conviction of the Holy Spirit, as, as he speaks to our hearts, let it drive us into the arms of Jesus. Satan wants to take that that conviction, and he wants to condemn us. He wants to take it, and he wants to push us down. Jesus wants to reveal to us our struggles, and he wants to draw us closer to him. So let's never forget the grace of God as we spend some time letting the Spirit of God probe 
our hearts. So let's look here. In John chapter 13, beginning in verse 18, it says this. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, we begin here with Jesus reminding his disciples that there is somebody in their midst who is the betrayer. Now, we know he's speaking of Judas, but he quotes Psalm 41 verse 9. But he makes this point. He's, he quotes scripture. He's like, look, one of you is going to be betraying me, and he's going to speak about this a little bit more in a second. But what's going on here is that, notice what he says in verse 19. He says, now I tell you before it comes to pass, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Now listen, it's important. Belief is our key to divintimacy. Now, if, you're, if you have your study guide in front of you, you might want to look down. Belief is our key to divintimacy. See, God has done everything. We just need to simply believe and trust that He will do what He has said we will do. And isn't it the truth that in our struggles with sin, it almost always comes back to faith, doesn't it? We desire intimacy and God has promised it, but yet we're looking for it in another area. God has promised he'll take care of us, but we start to doubt that he can take care of us. So we go and try and take care of ourselves. We don't know what to do. And instead of trusting in God, we take it upon ourselves. So for you and I, it's important to remember, belief is our key to divintimacy. We need to simply trust that God can do what he said he will do. Belief is our key. Now in verse 20, look at what it says. It says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me. To receive the messenger is to receive the sender. And to receive the sender is to receive God. Now I know we live in a day and age. We live in what they would call a pluralistic society. We live in a society where everyone's information, everyone's belief structure, everyone's opinion in the public sphere holds equal weight. Now, it's not a bad thing in a free country to have that as a premise, but the reality is, is just because it's someone's opinion doesn't make it a fact. So although we should be respectful of other people's opinions, Jesus makes it very clear that there's only one God and there's only one way to God and that is through Jesus, through himself. Either Jesus is the greatest egomaniacal narcissist who ever lived or he is the son of God. And every person, no matter where you are on the faith spectrum right now, if you are a true seeker, you're going to come and you're going to look at Jesus and you're going to have to deal with that. Just people always say, oh, you know, yeah, Jesus is great, great teacher. Really respect him. I'm like, but why haven't you even dealt with what he's saying? There's nothing worse than to call somebody a great teacher and never actually interact on any level with what they said. Jesus makes it very clear that there is one God and there is one way to God, and that is through him. And I know for me, before I became a Christian, that was a huge thing. Because I'm reading Jesus, and I'm like, look, I'm not going to try and pasteurize Jesus, make Jesus culturally acceptable. Let's just see what he says and deal with it. And he starts saying things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I was like, oh, no. That's not a culturally appropriate statement in 20th century America when I was reading it, or even more so now. But he said it. He said it. Now, as we move into verse 21, we're really going to focus down on this and the betraying heart. Look at what happens. When Jesus 
had said these things, verse 21, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciple looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. So Jesus, he tells them that this is going to happen. It's going to fulfill Scripture. And then he just comes straight out and says it. Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. The first thing we learn about the betraying heart is this, that the betraying heart begins with duplicity. See, Judas hid his true intentions completely. See, Judas was very much part of the apostolic band. He was treated by Jesus exactly the same as everybody else. It wasn't like Jesus said, one of you will betray me, and the disciples said, it's Judas. We know it's Judas, because Judas is a charlatan. Or, and it speaks about how amazing the love of Jesus was, Jesus knew Judas would betray him the whole time, and yet they never say, oh, we know it's Judas because Jesus doesn't like Judas. Jesus treats Judas differently than everybody else. No! They had no clue who it was. And the betraying heart begins with duplicity. For some of us in here today, let's be honest. You are a divided person. You're here today. And don't get me wrong. If you're the person I'm talking about, right? And, and there's a division in your heart. You're here. You're at church. You're worshiping the Lord. But you know, and God knows, that there are some issues there. Church is the best place for you to be. So I don't want you for one second to feel that, oh, I shouldn't be here. No, you should be here today. Because God wants you here to hear this. But the reality is, is that for a lot of us, we're here, we're, we're in church, we're fellowshipping with believers, but what we're doing outside of Sundays, outside of our meetings, is betraying of the truth. Judas was really good at looking like an apostle, speaking like an apostle, acting like an apostle. But in his heart, his heart was divided. He had other cares. So this betraying heart begins with duplicity. Now in verse 23, look at what happens. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now listen, I have an action step for you. You want to you wanna do battle against the, the betraying nature of your own heart? Right here. Just what John is doing. I love this. Then the disciples, or now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Here's an action step. Snuggle into Jesus and know the love. Snuggle into Jesus and know the love. Now, Pastor Bill last week mentioned there, they didn't sit around a table very formal. It, it wasn't like tea, you know, uh, formal tea time. They would, they would recline. I kind of like this. We should bring this back. You know, where you kind of lean in. You got like one arm down, just kind of eat. It sounds fun, doesn't it? It, it would make the siesta much easier. Because you can just kind of put your head down and just doze off for a little bit. But it's amazing that we have John the Apostle. He's right next to him and he's putting his head on the, on, on the chest of Jesus. When was the last time we snuggled in to Jesus? When was the last time we said, Lord, I just want to be that close to you? 
Now, I know for some of you guys, you're like, Pastor Daniel, snuggle in and know the love. Like, come on. But you know what? My seven-year-old son, Obadiah, he's a little dude. There's nothing my son doesn't love more than snuggling in with his Abba. There's nothing he doesn't like more than in the morning he comes on down like, give me a hug. And he doesn't, you know, he's at that age where he doesn't just give me like the, the fist pump and okay, dad. But he comes in, he puts his head on my chest and I'm like, man, how'd you sleep? And he'll tell me some crazy stories about things that he was dreaming about, like creating Lego monsters and all these things. But you know, for a lot of us, it's been a long time since we snuggled in and knew the love of God. I mean, talk about div intimacy. John, right there where he needed to be in the heart of Jesus. I love this. John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, the beloved apostle. Do you think that was only for John? Or do you think John was clued in to how God wants all of us to see ourselves? When was the last time someone said, hey, so what's, what's your name and what do you do? And you say, insert your name. My name is, and I'm a disciple whom Jesus loves. That is a proper self-assessment of any person who calls themselves by the name of Jesus. I could say, my name is Daniel, a disciple whom Jesus loves. For a lot of us, we struggle trusting that God loves us as he actually does. But God loves radically. Now look at what else happens. In verse 25, or in verse 24, Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask him who it was of whom he spoke. And leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? I love this. Peter's looking at John and saying, ask Jesus who it is. That's what he's doing. Now, action step number two to battle against the betraying nature of our hearts. Second, action step number two, ask the question. Brothers, sisters, ask the question. One of the other gospel accounts says that all the disciples ask, is it I, Lord? See, the reason a lot of our hearts betray us and betray our relationship with Jesus is because we're not willing to ask the question, Lord, what area of my life is unbecoming? Lord, what area of my life do you not get radical joy in? Are you willing to ask the question? See, you know what's amazing is that when you ask the question and when God answers the question, he never answers it in a condemnatory way. He wants us to understand where our struggles lie so that he can heal it, so that he can do something amazing in and through our lives. And that's an awesome, awesome thing. Awesome. Amazing. So are we willing to second ask the question, Lord, is it I? And look at verse 26. Now Jesus answered, It is he to whom it shall, I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. The third action step is simple. Trust Jesus' identification. They asked, Who is it? Jesus said, Listen, whoever I dip the bread and give it to, that's the person. Jesus desired to identify the betrayer amongst him. So if you are willing to ask the question, as action step number two is, action step number three, trust Jesus' identification. Are you willing to trust when Jesus puts his finger on some area of your life? I mean, how many of us, God has put his finger on an area of our lives and we're like, oh, no way, God. Like as if God doesn't know who we are. As if God doesn't see us naked and open without any filters, without any presumption. When God puts his finger on our lives, let's trust him. Say, okay, Lord, I see it. Will you heal me? Will you transform me? Will you do a work in and through my life? Now, as we continue to move here, look at what happens. Now, after the piece of bread... It says, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now in verse 27, we get this reality. That the betraying heart is Satan's handiwork. The betraying heart is Satan's handiwork. Now I need to say something because we live in a day and age where there's not a lot of talk about Satan. 
And when there is talk about Satan, normally the talk about Satan is completely unbiblical. So, so, so either way, we don't get it right. Either people don't want to talk about Satan, or when they do talk about Satan, they talk about him in a way that's unbiblical. I want to teach you something about Satan this morning. Satan is never to blame for your issues. Satan's job is simply to encourage us to do what we want to do naturally outside of God's Holy Spirit. So Satan is more like a cheerleader for evil than he is the person who makes us do evil. Does that make sense? See, the betraying nature of our heart is not Satan's fault. That's our own stuff. Satan just encourages us to be betraying. He just encourages it. And Satan's been doing it for a long time. Like if you look at Isaiah chapter 14 or Ezekiel chapter 28, you find that Satan, created by God as the glorious archangel, who when he spread his wings, all of heaven filled with the glory of God, he decided, I want that glory. I want it for me. It should be mine. And he betrayed. And he wants us to be just like him. It's interesting here. Judas takes the, the bread and Satan just jumps right on in there. He's ready to go. The betraying heart is Satan's handiwork. In the middle of verse 27, Jesus says to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he had said this. For some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast. Or that he should give something to the poor, having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, for it was night. Notice this next. The betraying heart misses the God pause and failed to repent. The betraying heart misses the God pause. Can you imagine what went through Judas's mind when Jesus says, What you do, do quickly? See, all through the Gospels, we find Jesus giving Judas an opportunity. We're going to see later in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When, when the multitudes, the, the troops come and Judas is there and Judas kisses Jesus. And Jesus says, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? It's like Jesus is giving Judas one more opportunity, one more chance to stop. But Judas doesn't take it. For so many of you, if you're here and you're like, yeah, I'm the betraying heart. That's totally me. Stop missing the God pauses. The moment that God gives you to, to realize what you're doing and simply repent. Repent is a biblical word, but it simply means to change direction. If you're on the five, right, and you're just, you can't wait to go to Seattle, but you find yourself going over the Columbia River from where we're heading. Aren't you heading in the wrong direction? So what do you do? You get off at the next exit. You turn around so that you can head north on the five, right? That's textbook repentance. You're going one direction. You realize you're going in the, the wrong direction. You get off the highway. You turn around. You head the other direction. That's repentance. Judas missed it again. Again. Now notice, in the last couple of verses here, Judas, the people didn't understand. The apostles didn't realize that Jesus was giving Judas an opportunity to repent. They thought, oh, well, Judas had the money box. Judas is the treasurer of the apostolic band. So, you know, he's just going to go out and get us stuff for the Passover feast. Finally, the betraying heart is marked by greater allegiances. So you know what we learn about Judas in John chapter 12? This is verses 4 to 6. It says, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Judas gave Mary a hard time for blessing Jesus because he wanted the money sold to, quote-unquote, give it to the poor. But they said that Judas used to take money out of the money box. The betraying heart is marked by a greater allegiance. Judas was the treasurer, but he loved the money more than he loved Jesus. We have to ask ourselves, what is our greater allegiances than Jesus? Is it security? Is it money? Is it the thought of a spouse? 
maybe a, a relationship, maybe a TV show or some garbage on the internet. What is the thing that you are more allegianced to other than Jesus? Whatever that thing is, that is your idol. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your 401k. Whatever your allegiance is that is greater than Jesus, that is your idol, and that marks a betraying heart. Now, as we move on, verses 31 to 35, we see the second heart, the people of God, the loving heart. Look at what it says. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we have four aspects or characteristics of a loving heart here. Look at first, verses 31 and 32. Do you see a word that's repeated over and over and over again? That word glorified. The Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Listen, the loving heart is focused on God's glory. The loving, God, the loving heart is focused on God's glory. See, the reason the loving heart has to be focused on God's glory is because God truly loves people without any mixture, an unconditional way, a way that is effective in changing someone's life. And the problem with most of our, our hearts and in the love that we have is we don't love with God's glory in mind. We love with our own glory in mind. Psychologists call this the law of reciprocal affection. I will love people who love me back. So if you give me love, I will return that love to you. It's kind of like if you know the, the TV show Seinfeld, the soup Nazi. You, you guys know this? If you don't, go, go look it up on YouTube. It's, it's classic. This guy, if you don't have your order ready, now of course it's New York, you know. So if you don't have your order ready when you get up there, the soup Nazi gets mad. He says, no soup for you. And he throws you out of the line. A lot of us love the way the soup Nazi serves a soup. I will love you back if you love me. But the moment you stop loving me, no love for you. I'm done with you. So you don't really love them. You love you. And you'll love people back who love you the way you want them to. That has nothing to do with love. That's self-centered. It's prideful. Self-focused. So the loving heart cares about the glory of God because God textbook loves people who don't love him back properly. That's me. We're in worship this morning. And we're singing and I stand with my arms high my heart abandoned. I just start weeping because I'm like, Lord, I want to have a more abandoned heart, Lord. I want to say all that I am is yours and it really be all that I am. Every thought, every work of my hands, everywhere I place my feet, Lord, I want that to be true. And I realize that I fall short. I want your glory more, God. The loving heart's focus is the glory of God. Lord, I will love to my own detriment for your glory. That's what Jesus taught us. Now, not only that, the loving heart identity is radically Christocentric. I'm going to say that again. That's a big phrase there. The loving heart's identity is radically Christocentric. Before Jesus even begins, before he even begins to tell us how we ought to live, he speaks about himself first. Look at what he said. I mean, it's just amazing here. He says, the Son of Man is glorified. He's like, I'm glorified, and God is glorified in me. If God is glorified in him, speaking of himself, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. See, the loving heart's identity is radically Christocentric. The loving heart views itself through cruciform glasses, cross-shaped glasses. 
In order to truly love, we need to behold the death and resurrection of Jesus in our hearts in such a profound way that our heart gets reshaped into the shape of the cross, cruciform shaped. Our heart's identity is drenched in Jesus. That's why I say it's radically Christocentric. Maybe the question for us today is, Lord, in what ways do I view myself in a way that is not cruciform shaped? That is not fitted by the cross? Oh, would to God that we would see ourselves radically Christocentrically. And then it moves into how it plays itself out. In verse 33, little children. I love when Jesus talks like that. He's 33 years old. And he calls his disciples little children. I mean, what endearment, what care, what he, you know, these guys are probably older than Jesus. He's like, little children. So, it's so sweet and endearing. He says, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Look at this. A loving heart knows that we love God by loving people. A loving heart knows that we love God by loving people. Our divintimacy with God plays itself out with the person sitting next to you. It is so much easier to say, God, I love you, than to love the person you've been married to for 20 years or 20 minutes. It's so much easier to say, Jesus, I just want to love everybody and then love your boss or love your employees or love that neighbor who everything about their life is wrong and they let their dog do their business on your lawn and they don't curb their own dog. It's so much easier to say, I love you, God, who I don't see than it is to love the people right in front of us. But God's Word teaches us that the loving heart knows that we love God by loving people. Now, don't forget this. In the Bible, we're exhorted to speak the truth in love. Those two need to come together. Truth and love. They come together. I heard John Stott in his commentary said this, love without truth is hypocrisy, and truth without love is brutality. That's powerful, isn't it? Think about it, because all of us struggle to love in a biblical way. If you love without truth, it's hypocrisy. There's all sorts of Christians today in the name of, I want to love people, are not willing to call a spade a spade. You do not love somebody that when they sin, you're not willing to tell them. That's not love. That's hypocrisy. So love without truth is hypocrisy. So we want to love people truthfully so that we're not hypocritical. But there's a whole bunch of other of us, we love the truth, but a truth without love is brutality. So we have the truth, we know the truth, and like Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, we're taking a sword and we're cutting off people's ears with the Word of God. What did Jesus do when Peter cut off Malchus's ear? He healed him. Jesus had to heal the wound afflicted by one of his followers. Brothers and sisters, let us radically love the people around us. In truth, willing to tell them the truth about what's going on, but loving them just the same. Not being brutal to them. Not hurting them. Not being mean to them. Not in the name of Jesus telling them how messed up they are. Instead saying, listen, we're all messed up, but God loves us. No matter what you're doing today, or if you're in here, or if you're watching on the web, or you're listening on the radio, listen, no matter what you've done, no matter how messed up it is, God still loves you. So much so they sent Jesus to die on a cross. Would to God that the people of God would be drenched in love for people. Isn't that the Apostle John says in 1 John 4, 7 to 11, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, 
we also ought to love one another. Amen. Hey, God, make us loving people. Enlarge our hearts to have the same bandwidth of love, God, that you have. And not only that, finally, the loving heart is concerned with our witness. Look at verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples by the love you have one for another. The loving heart is concerned with our witness. We don't just love each other so that church is a big old-fashioned love fest, agape fest, where we're just loving on each other. We do this because Jesus says, by this people will know you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. We live in a day and age where the church is so divided. I'm not saying just crossroads, but the body of Christ at large is so divided and there's people, they make their whole living as a minister ripping apart different parts of the body. And some of us, we love that stuff. Oh, so-and-so's a heretic. And this person says this. And oh, those people are really, really bad. By this, men will know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. Would, God, brothers, sisters, listen. A maturing church is a unified church. So, listen, and I get there are some people who call themselves Christians who are so far outside the Christian faith that we can't hold fellowship with them. But we're spending a lot of times ripping up and down people who sincerely love God. We just have differing opinions on secondary doctrines. And that, that is not okay. The world is watching a unified church. People from different, yeah, maybe they get real wild when they worship. Maybe people are very calm when they worship. And maybe some people teach verse by verse and other people teach topically and whatever. And some people believe Jesus is going to come back this way and some people believe Jesus come back that way. Either way, everyone believes Jesus is going to come back. Would to God that the church of Jesus Christ loves each other because the world is watching. And the world is watching and they're not seeing. They're not seeing us be the way God would have us be. Loving one another. A loving heart is concerned with our witness in the community, in the world. And then finally, we've seen the betraying heart. We've seen the loving heart. Now we see Peter, the denying heart. Now I need to make this point. Peter's denying heart is not denying Jesus, but his actions deny his profession. He's saying one thing and his actions are another way. And we're going to see this in these last few verses. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? I like this. The denying heart often has the right intention. It's amazing. Jesus just talked all about love. Peter didn't ask one question about love. He asked about verse 33 when Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't come. Isn't that, isn't that an adventure in missing the point? That whole section's about love and God's glory. And Peter's focused on, well, where are you going, Lord? Not like, Lord, make me a better lover. And not lover in an intimate sense, but make me a person whose heart loves people. He's like, but Lord, where are you going? See, the denying heart, and Peter's a classic case of somebody who often has the right intention. So for a lot of us, intentionality is not the problem. There's another problem. Look what Jesus says in verse 36. In the middle, Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? Hmm. <laughs> the denying heart will not simply listen to Jesus. Peter says, Lord, where are you going? Jesus says, you cannot go with me now. And Peter says, well, why not? See, oftentimes for those of us who realize that our actions are not in line with the things we say, oftentimes the root of it, you're not willing to simply listen to Jesus. When Jesus says, no, we say, but come on, please. When Jesus says, listen, I want you to do this, you're like, well, do you really mean you want me to do that? It's funny. I, I love my kids. Yeah, I feel bad for my kids a little bit because as a pastor, they're going to grow up and everyone's going to hear all these stories about them and it's like a big catalog of their life through a sermon. But it's amazing that when it's bedtime, my kids will do anything just to get two more minutes. It's like they're going to, they're like, I got to brush my teeth. I got to clean my room. It's like just so they get five more minutes before it's bedtime. But I always say to them, listen, that's great you want to brush your teeth. 
Great, you want to clean your room, but it's bedtime. See, and when, when kids do that, we know right away, that's disobedience, right? You're being asked to do one thing. You're trying to wiggle out any way you can. But we don't ever translate that to our spiritual lives. For some of us in here, we know God, Jesus has said, this is what I want from you. And you're like, but do I really have to? Are you sure? See, honoring God is simply doing what he asks us to do. Simply being obedient. Simply listening to Jesus. And Peter's denying heart. Jesus says, you can't go now. And he's like, Lord, why not? He's not willing to simply listen. And then look what he says. Again, in the, in the middle here of verse 37, he says, I will lay down my life for your sake. Look at this. The denying heart is presumptuous. You see that? The denying heart is presumptuous. He's not willing to simply listen to Jesus. He's got the right intentions, but he's like, Lord, I'm going to lay down my life for you. See, Peter has got an inflated self-view. He thinks he's got it together. He's ready to give up his life for Jesus. And we all know what's going to happen in a few chapters. He's not even going to be willing to tell a slave girl that he knows Jesus. How many of us, our actions deny our profession because we view ourselves higher than we really ought to because we're not taking an honest stock of where we are. Peter's presumptuous, and his presumption gets him in trouble. And look at what Jesus says in verse 38. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Wow. Peter's like, I'm going to lay down my life for you. He's, he's like, look, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And the rooster crows early in the morning. As a final point here, Jesus knows our denials and seeks to restore us. Jesus knows our denials and he seeks to restore us. And if you were to turn to John 21, you don't have to do it right now. You find Jesus restoring Peter by the Sea of Galilee. Do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Brothers and sisters, listen. No matter where you are today, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how betraying your heart is, no matter how denying your heart is, and even no matter how loving your heart is, Jesus knows all about you. He knows the whole thing, and he wants to restore us. For some of us here today, that restoration is simply coming to put your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time this morning. For other of us who've been walking with Jesus, you have a betraying heart. You have a denying heart. You have a duplicitous heart. You're presumptuous, even though you have the right intentions. Jesus knows exactly where you've been, and he wants to restore you. Now, it's interesting. Both Judas and Peter both did wrong. Judas would not come back and repent and ended up committing suicide. Peter wept bitterly came back, and God used him mightily. The only difference between Judas and Peter was that Peter was willing to return to Jesus after his mistakes and let Jesus restore him. Judas was unwilling. So the question is, is which one will you be today? Are you willing to own the mistakes? To say, Lord, I am making horrible mistakes. Return and let Jesus restore you. He knows it anyway. Or we can go the way of Judas, unwilling to return. But whichever one we are, would to God that we would be people who have loving hearts. That we would love God by loving people. That we would be into God's glory. That we'd let God shape our hearts in a cross shaped. And that we'd be concerned with our witness in the world. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, this is a challenging, challenging passage, God. And Lord, we acknowledge, Lord, that all of our hearts are laid bare over this text. Lord, we find ourselves in Judas's betraying heart and in Peter's denying heart. And Lord, we find ourselves, Lord, sometimes in that loving heart that you encourage us to be. And God, we ask, Lord, that you would do heart surgery, Lord, that your spirit would show us how our heart is doing. You know, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, as I was teaching, there were some people in here, you've never 
put your faith and trust in Jesus. God knows everything about you and he wants to restore you. But you have to be willing just to come to him. I know that God is tugging on some hearts in here today. And if that's you, you feel God saying, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You want your sins forgiven. If that's you, I just ask that you just raise your hand. Right where you are, raise your hand. Say, I want to commit my life to Jesus. God bless you. Right here in the center. If you're in the back, raise your hands up high so I can see you. I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. God bless you, my brother there in the back. Lord, I thank you for tugging on people's hearts. For those of you who put your hand up, I want to ask you just to stand up right where you are so I can see you. It's okay. God sees. I want you to come on down. There's men and women up here in the front. Come on down. Just walk on out your seats right down the aisle. If you're, someone's with you, just come on, walk down with the person you're there with. Come on down to the front. The men and women are here. They want to pray with you. They want to encourage you. God bless you, my brother. For some of us, we've been walking with the Lord for a long time. But we have that denying heart. We have that betraying heart. And we know it. And God knows it. And you're saying, God, I, I want you to restore me even though I've already put my trust in you. I'm not where I want to be. If that's you, raise your hand. Let me pray for you. God bless you here in the front as hands are going up all over the sanctuary. God bless you. God sees your heart. Lord, restore us, God. We have men and women right here in the front. We don't leave here without letting someone encourage you. So, so don't be shy. We're all going to stand up in a second. We want to encourage you, those who have your hand up. Come on down. Come talk to the men and women in front. Let them pray with you and encourage you in your most holy faith. Let God do his restorative work by his Holy Spirit today. So all, let's, let's all stand. We're going to worship the Lord together. But come on down to the front. Let these brothers and sisters pray with you.